Hello, hi. Uh, Hi, I'm Shashank. Uh, I, I work at Coinbase. I'm a, I'm a research manager there. I'm also a research partner for Dell Endum Ventures. Today, the, the panel is going to be on security in ZK systems. It's our fourth panel. Um, and we have, uh, we have several great speakers for you. Um, each, each speaker would have about 15 minutes to, to give their presentation, uh, about 30 minutes for, for the talk itself. and uh, say two minutes for Q&A. And if we have some time left in the end, we would like to also do a discussion panel. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. So we have we have a great set of speakers for you today. We have uh, David Wong from OF1 Labs, uh, Eli from Starkware, uh, Christopher Goes from Anoma, Morgan Thomas from Orbis Labs, and Yu Feng from UCSB and Veritas. And our first speaker is David Wong. Um, he'll talk about ZK security, a whole new layer to worry about. Cool. So I guess let me share my slides. Oh, uh, can everybody, everybody see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, I guess stop me if, I, if I'm going over uh, the, the 13 minutes. Um, not, not sure how long this will go for, but anyway, so I'm here to talk about ZK security and that's the word I just made up. Um, I like it, so I'm going to keep using it, but, uh, it's, what, what is ZK security? Basically it's, it's uh, kind of a mapping of like what is what and, and what is where, uh, to try and figure out like what to worry about, uh, when you use ZK systems in your, in your protocols. And I guess I'm, I'm mostly going to focus on cryptocurrencies. Um, but some of it can apply to, to anything. Uh, uh, cool. So let's start with, uh, from a high level, like, uh, you have users in your system, uh, perhaps, and they're writing programs in this kind of high level language. Um, so, uh, we, we already know that like Ethereum, uh, has been doing that for a while. People write, uh, programs and they, these are like in solidity, uh, mostly, um, and, and, and there are bugs, right? Like we've seen bugs in solidity and things like that. So what, what can you do? So we've seen things like improving the high level language. Uh, if you improve solidity, you can kind of like try and prevent bugs. Uh, you can improve the VM itself. You can maybe make smart contracts updatable. Um, not all of them are, but, but more and more are, are trying to do that. Um, and recently we've seen even like languages that are built from the ground up with formal verification like move. Uh, so, so, so there's that. And now that we're introducing ZK apps, um, so you can think of like things like Cairo or snarky JS, uh, then you can have bugs that are quite different from the bugs we're used to in, in, in Ethereum. And, uh, so for example, one category of bugs is like, uh, hints. So hints is something, I guess, from Starkware, but I like the term, so I'm gonna reuse it. Uh, basically, the, these are things that are unconstrained in your program. These are things that you can, as the prover, just uh, give. And if you don't constrain them, they can be random values. And sometimes that's what you want. You want them to be random values. Sometimes you actually don't want that. So, so you, you need to make sure they're constrained. Um, so I, I believe like we're, we're gonna see new categories of bugs and, and some of these bugs are gonna be that. Um, since you're working in fields, um, and not in the usual types uh, that you might be used to, like U256 in, in Ethereum or, or U64, these kind of things, uh, you also need to be careful with, with wrapping around and, and these kind of things. Um, and also because, uh, some of these functionalities might, um, include private privacy features, uh, I, Perhaps not in Starknet, but uh, but you have other ZKAP systems where you can write uh, uh, private applications, and so the the user has to make sure that their application also doesn't leak, uh, trivially leak uh, uh, privacy data. Cool. Uh, I guess that's a a, a screenshot of a uh, Snarky JS to kind of show you uh, what these languages look like, uh, and this this one is. So you pretty much write your smart contract using TypeScript or your, your programs that you're gonna approve uh, with a zero notch prover using TypeScript. And it's, it's usually pretty straightforward. Um, so, yeah. 
Cool. So, so once the user writes their program in the high level language, you have a compilation phase. Um, in the case of uh, the VM paradigm, you get VM instructions, uh, so some sort of program in, in these VM uh, uh, instructions. And if you're working in the, I guess, circuit paradigm or FPGA paradigm, you get gates, arithmetic gates. And so uh, here you can have other issues. So uh, that's why I call the front end. And as any front end, you can have bugs. Uh, like this is not new. Um, but if we're talking specifically about these ZK front ends, uh, usually they're made out of gadgets and hints and gadgets are basically um, assemblage of different gates that are supposed to constrain what you want to constrain. And you, you need to make sure that they're, they're constraining the right things and that they're sound and complete and all of these things. Uh, so, so you can also have this type of bugs in, in the compiler. Um, and I believe that's where debugging tools are going to be very uh, important to make sure that your compiler is doing the right thing. Um, and actually, I've, so I was listening to a, a podcast the other day with John Carmack and, and Lex Friedman. And John Carmack was saying that, like, he's used to, since he started programming, to look at the output, the SMD output of whatever he writes in code. Um, and I thought that was interesting because that's exactly what I guess most of us, most of us want when we write these ZK apps, we want to see like what's the actual output uh, to see if it's actually efficient, optimized, secure, and, and all these kind of things. Um, so I've actually been toying around with this DSL. Uh, it's called Nonem because I don't have a better name for it. If you have a suggestion, I'll take it. And basically, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, basically the output will tell you for every uh, line of code you wrote, or for every gate that you generated, what line of code generated that gate. And it's like a Rust inspired uh, language. And you also get a comment. So it tells you exactly why I added these gates uh, and what line did that. And also for the wiring, um, what, what am I wiring here? Uh, so yeah, I, I think we're going to see more and more tools like that to, to be able to debug. And, um, anyway, so if you're not in the VM paradigm, you, you're compiling things and you're getting gates. And usually there's a second compilation phase where you give that to your proof system and that's going to produce a prover and verifier key or indexes. And this is what you use to prove and, and verify. Uh, of course, the proof system is still here in the VM uh, model. You're just uh, using it differently. And uh, so let's talk about that. So these things are protocols are usually uh, written in papers and that you have to implement. Uh, they're often hand wavy uh, in some parts. Um, for, for example, zero knowledge uh, or uh, the fiat chenier uh, transformation are often not really explained uh, in details. And so you, you have to make, make that up when you're implementing that. Actually, there's way more details that you have to get right in practice. Uh, thanks God we have artworks uh, if you're writing stuff in Rust because it takes care of a lot of things. Um, but yeah, so if you're, uh, give me a sec. If your per system has a bug, um, that, that's a problem depending on what your protocol is. Uh, if you're a cryptocurrency, you might have to hard fork to fix that. And that's what a Zcash uh, had to do, for example. Um, so that's something to consider in practice also. Oh yeah, so I guess I wanted to talk about some bugs just as examples of bugs. Uh, this is an example of an implementation bug. Um, if you haven't heard of it, there was the zero bug. And this is the zero zero bug from the same author. Um, and basically it's a series of bugs where you can just send like a zero signature or a zero proof in this case, and the verifier is just gonna validate it. And so that's that's a good example of like, you can get the protocol right, but if you mess up something in your implementation and here it was like a type, uh, basically the uh, types uh, or something like that, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna have trivial uh, breakage as well. And this is an example of a protocol uh, error, uh, Frozen Heart came up not so long ago, uh, where basically Fiat Chamier was not, um, I believe, specified correctly and implemented correctly. Uh, all right, I guess you'll get the slides at the end uh, for the links. Um, okay, so another thing I wanted to mention is that, okay, you have a proof system, you implemented that, uh, you think it's right, now you want another pair of eyes. And so usually uh, there, there's different ways to do that. Uh, one way is to find auditors and experts to review it, but it's pretty hard uh, to review proof systems. There's not that many people who can do it, who have the expertise to do it. 
And when they have the expertise to do it, they're usually busy doing other things or, um, or they created their own project and, and something like that. Um, so what I like is the way Zcash found their bug is that they just hired Ariel and Ariel, Ariel was just poking around trying to understand the protocol and he found the bug by spending time. And I guess time is the, the, the secret here. You have someone spending time to try to understand the, the protocol. Uh, and that's how I found the bug. Um, and yeah, that's, that's usually a good way. So what is, what is implemented exactly is also something else. It's, it, so, so I'll say every time you have a paper and every time you have a paper, what's implemented is different from the paper. Um, people end up imp implementing optimizations or changing slightly, slightly the protocol um, and, and the protocol evolves and you're not gonna update the paper or it's not your paper. Um, so we had this problem, I guess, for Mina. And what we ended up with was something called cargo specification or cargo spec. It's a language agnostic tool to specify um, your code, basically. So there's always this problem where your spec sort of goes up out of dates um, from, from your implementation. And so we, we kind of ended up with this sort of middle ground where you have um, spatial comments in your code. So, so you can modify the comment as you modify your code. At least it's as close as we, as we can get. And then you have a specification uh, .toml, so a configuration file where you list all of the files that you want to extract. And then you have your um, markdown specification with some placeholders that will get replaced by these comments from your code. And so um, that's why we use to, to specify kimchi, our proof system. And so it works pretty well. You have you know um, tables and callouts and latex equations and table of contents and all of that. Um, you can see an example on how we specify a proof. We have a diagram that's actually implemented in code. We have uh, data structures that are extracted directly from the code. So we, they never go out of date uh, in our spec. And you also have, uh, you can see on the right, a list of steps that you have to follow if you want to um, analyze the, or implement the, the, the proof creation. And that's usually what people will look at if they don't really uh, read code or if they don't have the time to read code and they want to formally analyze the protocol or these kind of things. Um, so it's been very useful for us. And, and that's sort of a, what we've been using also to review the code and make sure that uh, if the pro protocol makes sense, then the, the implementation makes sense as well. Um, all right, sorry for speeding up. I, I mean, for being fast, but I think I don't have the, the full 15 minutes. So, uh, okay, so proof system. Um, I didn't mention, but uh, inside the proof system, you also have uh, some circuitry logic. In the case of a uh, pre-process NARCs or like, like Plonkish protocols, I guess uh, you have custom gates, which are basically sort of like um, circuits. And uh, in the case of the VM paradigm, uh, you basically encode the logic of your, of your VM in your circuit. Uh, that's basically what you're doing. And so if you're handling custom gates, which is a special type of gates that you can use to reduce the number of gates uh, in your programs. If you're doing that, you basically have to make sure uh, like gadgets that they're sound and complete and that uh, you don't have any bugs there. And for a VM, it's, it's much more involved uh, and harder to verify in general. Um, and that's why I believe Cairo uses formal verification there uh, to make sure that uh, the constraints are, are, are correct. Uh, Cool. Uh, and something I didn't mention is that some proof systems have trusted setups. Uh, we don't have one, uh, so we don't have to worry about that, but um, some of them do. And usually uh, they're not fun. Everybody I talked to basically told me that uh, it's horrible to do a ceremony for a trusted setup. Um, it's not really like a ceremony in the HSM world uh, or certificate authority world, because usually you don't want to be in the same room and, and you want to, to be very careful um, with what you're doing. And that's, yeah, again, there was a Zcash, the Zcash bug I keep mentioning was there. Um, and so it's it's really another uh, thing you need to worry about. And if something goes wrong there, you have to do, um, in the case of Zcash, they had to do a hard fork. So so it's not trivial to, to fix as well. Um, and I guess I'll mention that one more time. Okay, so um, once you have your, your program, either in VM instructions or as a verifier key, you need to deploy that in your protocol. Um, in the case of cryptocurrency, that, that's sort of the smart contract that you deploy. 
on chain. Um, and the question is, uh, once you deploy that, what, what if there's a bug there? So in Ethereum, I guess the solution was updatable smart contracts, uh, which is totally something we can do. Um, another question is once deployed, what if there's a bug in the front end? So the, the compiler on the left. Um, so if there is a bug there, it's basically the same as in Ethereum. You pretty much have to um, update your compiler and recompile and redeploy uh, if you can redeploy, if your smart contract is updatable. Um, Interestingly, in the case of, I guess, StarkNet or, um, I mean, I guess project that uses a VM, maybe you can patch all the programs that are deployed yourself. Or, I mean, if you're the admin, you know, cryptocurrency setting might be harder uh, because you basically would have to do a hard fork and everybody would have to agree that you're patching everybody's smart contracts in the system. Um, for pre-processed uh, or pre-processing snarks, it's, uh, I guess more difficult or impossible because you, the verifier key here that you're uh, deploying is basically a compression of your program and you can't really modify that. Um, cool, and, and so the other question is once deployed, okay, uh, what if there is a bug in the proof system? And if there is a bug in the proof system, uh, basically it depends where the bug is. Um, if it's in the protocol of the proof system, which mo most likely it is, then uh, you're lucky because you won't have to most likely you won't have to change anything and you're, well, you'll have to fix your proof system, of course, but the programs that you deployed will still be valid. Uh, the VM instructions will still be valid. Uh, your VM is still the same and the same for your, your gates or your verifier key. Uh, but if you have a bug in the VM itself or the VM circuits um, or the custom gates that I mentioned earlier, then uh, you you have a bigger issue and, and uh, same thing you have to, uh, um basically hard fork and make sure that people redeploy their 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 apps and that's uh that's yeah quite a quite an issue so yeah i guess you don't want to have bugs in this uh in these parts of the system uh not only because it's bad but it's it's hard to recover okay and lastly i guess uh i wanted to talk about the application itself if you have um if your application is itself is zk file uh which is the case for mina um and you have privacy, which is not the case for me now, I guess. At the application level, it can be a real issue. Uh, we've seen that with Tornado Cash, um, where I guess some government bodies or regulators are not gonna be happy if you cannot if they cannot see what's happening there. Um, and it also can be a problem from a protocol perspective. So that's the last time I'm going to mention Zcash, but with the bug they had, uh, I guess people could have created money out of thin air and nobody would have noticed. Uh, because um, all the values are masked. And so um, if you have privacy at the, at the protocol level, it's really hard to um, recover from that if there is a, a bug there uh, or something wrong. If any, if, if that is, uh, that is if you can detect uh, that there is a, there's an issue. So, so I've heard of the turnstile system, which is that you're moving from a shielded pool of money to another shielded pool of money, but in between you're going in the clear. And so it forces you to see exactly how much money is moving from one pool to the other. And like that, you can detect it if there's more money than was supposed to be in the first pool. Um, but usually if you detect that, then your system is just gonna go down because nobody's gonna use, uh, want to use it anymore. So um, cool, I think this is all I have. Yeah, uh, I don't know how, how much time I took, but uh, yeah, that's it. Was my microphone on the whole time? <laughs> I hope so. Hello, hi. Uh, yeah, that was that was a great talk. Uh, yeah, and yes, your microphone was on the whole time, and we could hear right. everything. Yeah, it's good, <laughs> good to know. Yeah, right. yeah, but yeah, fantastic talk. Uh, uh, we don't have any time for questions, though. We can take some questions at the end. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so now we have Eli from Starkware. We'll talk about security Hi. Starks theory and practice. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, can you please share the, um, the slides that I sent earlier? 
and I'll just uh, use them. Ah, good. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to talk about uh, this um, security of uh, proof systems in general and uh, in particular for Starks. So next slide, please. Um, there are basically five main areas um, uh, that I'm going to, well, I'm going to speak only about four of them, but let me just mention where there could be problems. The first area is with the primitives, the building blocks, or the assumptions that you are using um, and basing the security of your protocol on. So if one of these assumptions gets broken, then suddenly your system is insecure. For instance, um, if you're assuming that the discrete log is hard or things like that, then if uh, suddenly there's a quantum computer, then the system is broken. If you're using uh, SHA-2 and there's a collision found in it, then you know that gets broken. Anyway, so that's the first area that you have to worry about. The second, which is, um, I think one of the most uh, tricky areas in terms of uh, mathematical depth is proving the security or soundness of your protocol, assuming the crypto primitives. And um, there, there are a lot of nuances there. You know, is it a proof of knowledge system? Meaning by, you know, how do you argue that when you see a proof, you know, that the prover has knowledge of, of the inf relevant information? And, you know, how do you prove uh, it's zero knowledge? You need to show a simulator and so on and so forth. So that's usually the trickiest part in terms of uh, mathematical depth. But assuming that you, you know, your crypto primitives are fine and the protocol is indeed proven to be have the attributes you want it to have, um, there's also the question of arithmetization, which means usually you prove this uh, generic protocol with respect to any uh, you know, language uh, in the computational complexity sense. But now you have specific statements that you want to prove. These could be, you know, shielded transactions on Zcash. This could be the DYDX system or any number of other systems on StarkNet. It could be uh, the Cairo virtual machine and things like that. And then finally, suppose you have the basic arithmetization correct. There is also the question of uh, when I think of, we'll get into details, but arithmetization is still something more in the mathematical realm. And then there's just the question of, you know, did you code everything properly right? And the fifth element that I'm not talk going to talk about is leakage. You know, maybe everything's right, but uh, now your system leaks information. This is relevant only in the context of ZK, but, uh, you know, StarkNet and StarkX are not about uh, privacy. They're only about scalability. So this is not relevant at the moment. So now I'm just going to go over all these different uh, aspects and discuss how we address them in the context of Starks. But all of these five apply to any of the um, uh, any crypto system. You have to worry about these. Well, if it's not zk, you don't have to worry about five, but you have to worry about one to four. So um, for Starks, um, th there there are many things that are make it very future proof and very uh, safe and so on. And one of the areas is the uh, very lean cryptographic assumptions that you need. So in particular, um, the only crypto primitives that is used if you build an interactive Stark is the existence of some collision resistant hash. It doesn't have to be a cryptographically secure one. Um, and actually, if the particular collision resistant hash you used happens to get broken, then it's pretty simple to replace it with some other collision resistant hash. That's the only thing that you need. In the case of non-interactive Starks, the assumption that is used to analyze them is that of what's called the random oracle model, which is a very convenient abstract model that is loved for practical applications um, you know, it is basically we're all using the random oracle model and the Fiat Shamir heuristic, which is, so the problem with the random oracle model, it's a beautiful model from a, um, from a theoretical point of view, but it is, uh, mathematically known to be, um, you know, unrealizable. Uh, for instance, uh, it's what's called Kolmogorov complexity or the complexity of defining random function is just too long. Uh, for it uh, to be so like 
SHA-2 and AES and all of the crypto primitives that we all use day in and day out, they are not random functions. They are very structured functions. So when people finish doing analysis in the random oracle model, they usually res resort to the Fiat Shamir heuristic and uh, you know we sort of work under that assumption. Um, and basically all of computer security assumes the Fiat Shamir heuristic and the random oracle model. Um, so just summarizing, um, in terms of crypto primitives, uh, Starks are as safe as it gets. I'm not aware of any proof system in which uh, uh, things are better. So, um, and then the next thing I wanna say is, so can you move to the next slide, please? So this is from a talk I, I gave in a blog I wrote about, uh, I called it the Cambrian explosion of crypto proofs. And uh, I, I just wanna use it to point out that um, if you look at crypto assumptions, uh, there are other proof systems, you know, snarks and plonks and supersonic and bulletproofs that operate under different assumptions. And a lot of these, not all, but a lot of these are very number theoretic heavy, which means that they are, uh, you know, they would succumb to quantum computers. And some of these assumptions are also newer, like knowledge of exponent and things like that. So generally speaking, uh, Starks, which lie on the left-hand side, are pretty secure in terms of the crypto assumptions. Um, which is part of your security analysis. Let's please move to the next slide. So the next question is, what about your core protocol? In our case, it is, uh, we work in basically two models, models. Most of the constructions are built in a model called the interactive Oracle proof model, which is an abstract model uh, in which uh, you don't need any cryptography to prove things. And then we use the um, Fiat Shamir heuristic to analyze things in the real world. So um, the way you usually go about proving protocols is basically um, you write papers, you put theorems, and then you submit it to you know, conferences and journals, um, which we did for all of the core constructions of uh, Stark. There are also, um, you know, actual proofs of things like uh, knowledge extractors and ZK simulators and things like that. In many of the other number theoretic constructions, um, the assumption is very, very close to the um, you know, property you want to be. In many of them, and I don't want to name names, but in many of them pretty much, the assumption is that it works and has the properties you want and you don't actually prove it. So in terms of mathematical resilience of the protocol, uh, I think we're very confident. We went even an extra step in this. We have to thank the Ethereum Foundation for when we wrote uh, the ETH Stark documentation, the Ethereum Foundation requested and also funded an external soundness audit on the mathematical level by um, you know independent, highly regarded researchers in computational complexity, uh, Venkat Goswami and Amnon Tashma. And uh, you know they also vetted the parameters and the setting of uh, the Stark protocol. So now um, you have your protocol. The question is, what about arithmetization? So when you take, a, so let's please move to the next slide. So what does arithmetization mean? It is the process by which you reduce a statement about computational integrity to um, some problem or some question about local relations between a bunch of polynomials. And just an example, you know, um, Bob is claiming that he knows a SHA-2 preimage of Z. Let's please move to the next slide. So he starts with a claim that is very computational. Let's please move to the next slide. Arithmetization converts it to a problem that may look something like this. There are two polynomials, you know, Q, which is a polynomial in four variables and R and a degree bound D. Let's move to the next. And the arithmetization output claim is, Bob says, I know four polynomials of degree D, uh, let's call them A, B, C, and D, such that if you plug them in in the right places, the polynomials Q and R, you get some sort of relation that vanishes. Uh, let's move to the next slide. And now uh, this is, you know, snarks, plonks, bulletproofs, a whole bunch of systems, they all use arithmetization. So this is what arithmetization looks like. And 
The real question is, okay, I, you know, did I do this process correctly? So I started with a computation talking about SHA-2. I have this polynomial Q and R in this relation. Is it the right relation? And it's a very tricky question. So let's move to the next slide, please. So um, what we did uh, in our specific case, okay, at first we built a whole bunch of systems by hand and we had very gnarly polynomial constraints that were actually hard to deal with. So we did some audits for them internally, but there wasn't, you know, it was very hard to work with it. And part of the reason for inventing Cairo was to have a very lean virtual machine that is Turing complete and easy enough to work with and program general computation, but that it's air, uh, it's arithmetization is very lean. There are around 50 polynomial constraints. Many of them are Booleanity constraints and all of them are degree two, so that you can uh, have a better chance of verifying that the specification actually equals, you know, is, is equivalent to the set of polynomials that you have. And indeed, um, you know, my, my peers at Starkware, along with uh, Professor Jeremy Avigad and Dr. Yav Segener published already one paper, there are others in the pipeline, proving using the lean automated theorem proof system that the specification in terms of, you know, assembly code or description of the um, transition function of the Cairo virtual machine actually is equivalent to the constraint system of polynomials that, that defines it. So I think we went there, you know, one extra step as we often do at Starkware. And we are fairly confident that that part is, is pretty safe. But, you know, of course, there are other aspects of Cairo, like the built-ins and, you know, other aspects that still have not been lean proved. And, you know, hopefully we'll get to that someday. So now um, the last aspect is, okay, so you know what, for instance, what the set of polynomials is, you know what the verifier and prover should do. Um, you know, can you actually write the code that, that, that in, a, in a good way? So there, one nice thing is you don't have to worry about the prover at all. You only have to care about the verifier because the whole notion of a Stark is that as long as the verifier is correct, then, you know, the prover uh, doesn't really matter what it does. Um, so you don't really need to audit the prover. Uh, if you had zero knowledge, you would have to audit the prover to make sure that it doesn't leak information. But for scalability, the prover doesn't really need any audits. Now, what did we do with the, uh, well, you know, claim, knowing that something doesn't have bugs is, is you know, is a very, very hard problem. It ultimately reduces to the halting problem. There's no like, you know, provable way to make sure that, that you don't have bugs. So audits are the way to go. Um, the smart contracts for Cairo in Solidity have been audited by crypto experts, an amazing team of cryptography researchers that we're very happy to strategically partner with. And uh, an interesting thing is that, you know, we now have uh, recursive Starks, which means that we wrote the verifier for Stark and Cairo and all of the protocol in the Cairo programming language. So now there's another set of code that needs audit. So for that, and this, you know, we just turned it on like a few weeks ago. So we did an internal audit at Starkware, basically involving a team of uh, researchers that did, did not involve the folks that wrote the code. But of course, we're not sufficiently happy with that. And we, we contracted crypto experts for this job as well to audit this part. So this summarizes what we at Starkware have done with, with our proof systems in addressing the various security um, aspects. And take any questions if we have time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Eli. Uh, great presentation. I really like how you presented the five layers of security. Um, and uh, that Starkware is, is investing so much on auditing. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, time for questions, uh, but we might get questions in the end, uh, or there may be questions in the chat that you could respond to, but let's move on to this next talk. We go, go next. Uh, Morgan is from Orbis Labs, and he's going to talk about uh, formally verified, uh, sorry, we didn't get a chance to read that. Yeah, but formally verified circuit programming made easy. Oh. Hi, um, can y'all hear me? Can y'all see my screen? Yes, and yes. Okay, great. Um, so 
the problem I want to talk about is given some fact which we know constructively, i.e. we have a witness proving that it's true, um, how do we prove the fact succinctly and or in zero knowledge? This is a familiar problem to y'all and these desired solution characteristics I think you'd agree with. We want something that's general purpose, whatever fact we're interested in proving, we can apply it. And we want it to be uh, low cost to uh, create these systems that create these proofs. We want these proving systems to be relatively low cost to prove correct. Um, and we want them to be efficient and scalable. Um, and as you know, we uh, all, well, all of the ZKP systems that I know of, they rely on arithmetization. Uh, using various concepts of arithmetic circuits. And our goal is to find an arithmetic circuit, which will let us prove a given class of statements. Um, so uh, when do we say the arithmetic circuit is correct? Well, it has to denote the set of facts that we're interested in proving. What, is, what does that mean? Well, let's consider the facts as a set. Um, and uh, let's say that the circuit is correct if it denotes some isomorphic set where we're thinking of the denotation of the circuit as the set of instance values on which it's satisfiable. Um, so we put those in bijection with the statements we want to prove. Here's an example, running example of Sudoku. Um, we want to prove in zero knowledge that a uh, given Sudoku problem has a solution. So our intended donate denotation is this set of facts that x is solvable for each solvable Sudoku problem. And um, our instance values will represent the problems. Um, OK, so a uh, quick survey of different ways to create a correct arithmetic circuit. You could write the circuit by hand, uh, and so to speak, and, and prove it correct by hand. Um, and we're familiar with the challenges there. It makes writing an assembly language look like a cakewalk. Um, so then another step up in abstraction is you could write the circuit in components um, and patch them together using some sort of layout algorithm. That's what Halo 2 offers. Um, or for another step up in abstraction, you could use a circuit programming language of which I've named some examples. Um, and I'm claiming there's another step up in abstraction we can take here, which is to use a circuit spec language, such as the Orbis specification language. Um, so what do I mean by a circuit spec language? Well, the spec of a circuit is the set of facts it should prove. Um, and so uh, a notation for writing sets of facts could be a circuit spec language. Um, and that's notably different from a programming lang language in that in a programming language, um, you're specifying a procedure for checking you know, whether the fact is true. Um, so what I want here is a language for just specifying the fact, um, or the set of facts, rather. Um, and then I want a compiler that will produce a circuit denoting that set of facts. Um, so this work is based on sigma 1, 1 arithmetization. Um, the, there are a few theses here. Um, the idea is that. Uh, whatever we're interested in proving that we could prove with an arithmetic circuit, we could denote that set of facts by a sigma 1 1 formula. Um, and we can turn that, we can turn any sigma 1 1 formula into a circuit. Um, and then the, uh, the role of OSL in here is that sigma 1 1 formulas, while it's a very simple logical language, it's not very user friendly for writing specs. And so OSL is just a layer on top of that with which we can. Uh, it adds, you know, user-friendly features for spec writing. Um, so uh, this concept uh, is, uh, yeah, expressed by this commutative diagram here. Um, this is in the category of sets. So uh, on the bottom, you can see the compilation pipeline denoted. And uh, the statement that this diagram commutes is just saying that um, this compilation process is denotation preserving which is the correctness property that we're interested in. Um, sigma 1 1 formulas in a little more detail. Um, you can talk about uh, numbers, uh, that is to say elements of some ring. Um, you can add and multiply them. You can apply functions to them. Um, the functions always produce a ring element as an output. Um, and using those basic uh, notations, you can form 
equality and inequality comparisons between ring elements um, to form uh, formulas. And then you can combine formulas using Boolean operations and you can surround them with quantifiers. Um, quant you have first order and universal bounded existential quantification. Um, these bounds are arbitrary terms. And you also have second order bounded existential quantification where you have terms bounding the codomain and each element, each uh, you know, coordinate of the domain. Um, and so uh, this, these sigma 1, 1 formulas seem to be exactly the uh, like subsystem of second order arithmetic, which has the same power as arithmetic circuits. If you add any power, like if you go to you know, sigma 1, 2, uh, you know, you, you can't arithmetize it anymore. It's too powerful. Um, so let's see an example of um, OSL. Um, this is the running Sudoku example. First, we've got some type definitions. Um, fin 9 here, this is denoting the type of numbers between 0 and 8. Um, so uh, a value in a cell uh, would be one of those, or um, a cell coordinate would be one of those. A problem would be a function from a cell coordinate to um, either nothing or a value is filled in there. And then a solution provides a value for every cell. Um, also, the Sudoku grid is divided into three, three by three squares. So we can denote um, you know, the index of one of those squares or uh, an index within one of those squares. And here's a function that will take a square index and an index within a square and give you the corresponding cell index. I'll gloss over that. Um, so here we have the statement that a given solution is well formed. What does that mean? It means it has the numbers 0 through 8, all of them in each column and in each row and in each of the 3 by 3 squares. So, so this clause here uh, says for every row, um, and for every value, there's some column such that the value of the solution in that row and column is the stated value. So this is, in other words, stating that each row contains each number. And then the next one here states that each column contains each number. And the third one states that each square contains each number. Um, next, we have the statement that a given solution uh, matches, is consistent with a given problem. Um, this is just saying that um, at each cell, uh, if there is a value in the problem, then that value is the same value that is in the solution. Um, and finally, we can define the statement that a given Sudoku problem is solvable. Um, given the problem, there exists some solution such that the solution matches the problem and the solution is well formed. Um, so how are we going to implement this? How are we going to prove that it's correct? Well. Um, Here's the, what the compilation pipeline looks like. Um, so from a sigma 1, 1 formula, uh, we go to a structure called a semi-circuit. The idea of this is the sigma 1, 1 formula is denoting a finite set of concrete facts, um, which could be uh, denoted by a circuit. And with the semi-circuit, we're just breaking it down into those concrete facts that the formula denotes. Um, but not yet laying them out in a matrix structure. Um, and then with the next step, we're laying out those facts in a matrix structure with local constraints, but the constraints are more powerful than just polynomial constraints. We can use equality and inequality comparisons and Boolean operations in our constraints in this logic circuit step. And then in our final stage of our pipeline, we get rid of those and get an arithmetic circuit with using Planckish arithmetization with local polynomial constraints. Um, so yeah, we're building this out in Coq. And at the end, we're going to generate Rust code that uh, you know, uh, creates that circuit in Halo 2. Um, longer term, the intention is to formally verify the entire proving stack. Um, so uh, the proof strategy is essentially we need to prove this diagram commutes. On the bottom, we have the compilation pipeline. And this diagram commuting is just the statement that the denotations are preserved. Um, in terms of performance characteristics, 
the rows uh, depends on the size of function tables and uh, the amount of cases that we need to consider in the universal quantification. Um, and the number of columns and the polynomial degree bound, those are sublinear in the number of symbols in the sigma 1 1 formula. There's an exact formula for the number of columns that I didn't write out here because it's messy. I don't have a formula for the polynomial degree bound. And we can trade off between the number of columns and the polynomial degree bound by adding advice columns. Um, there are a number of optimizations we can do on this automatically. Um, so uh, like my thesis is that um, a long-term sustainable approach to building circuits and proving them correct um, is to use a compiler, use automated optimizations, um, prove that the compiler is correct rather than proving that each circuit is correct, um, and eventually you know, get these automated optimizations to a point where um, these circuits can compete with handwritten circuits. Um, I believe that's practical and that sigma 1 1 arithmetization uh, provides a path to get there. Um, here is some references to uh, research and open source code pertaining to this. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Morgan. That, that was a great talk um, and, and very useful work. Thank you. Uh, and, and if you would like to, uh, if the audience, anybody in the audience would like to read more about uh, uh, formal verification in general, then uh, um, you can check out uh, the latest blog post we have on our, on our website uh, uh, called Formal Verification of ZK Constraint Systems. Okay. So I think we'll have to go back to the third speaker. Christopher, are you online? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Could you share your slides, please? Would you be able to share them? I just sent them, but maybe that was not, or someone could share them. Yeah, Abraham, can you share the screen? Amazing. Thank you so much. And sorry for the trouble. Yeah, no Speaking problem. of some program that needs some defensive compiler design. Um, so I'm Christopher. I work at, at Heliax on Enoma. And I'm going to talk about defensive ZKP compiler pipeline design. But now that there have already been a few talks, you can go ahead to the next slide. I can situate uh, where this talk lies more precisely. I think in one of Eli's slides, he put like four starting as code and everything before four was proof system arithmetization. And this talk really only deals with four onwards. Um, and the reason it deals with four onwards uh, is you know, partially because that's where we think we can best help out, but also partially because, at least to me, the motivating question is, if most general purpose applications of CKPs will require programmable privacy, what compiler stack can allow developers to safely write programs and also produce efficient outputs? And the reason why that's the motivating question is that uh, the things which are many are the programs ultimately. Like we'll have you know a few proof systems and maybe a few different compiler stacks, and those might have bugs, and we'll need to iron out those bugs and formally verify those parts. But they will be like relatively finite in number compared to the actual programs. And if you look at comparable examples, like say the EVM, the Ethereum Virtual Machine, and the Solidity compiler, you know, early on in the history of Ethereum, the EVM, and Solidity the EVM and the Solidity compiler both had a lot of bugs. And often, you know, bugs in programs were, if not equally likely, then at least non-trivially likely to be due to a bug in the compiler or the EVM as opposed to a bug in the like program, like the developer thinking about it wrong. But over time, as the EVM and Solidity uh, solidified and just became better understood, more formally modeled in different ways. Uh, the frequency of bugs in those has declined, you know, in the case of EVM, perhaps to zero in the case of Solidity, uh, to a very low number and to mostly minor ones. And now most of the problems, if you go on like DeFi, Rect, or whatever, most of the bugs, which have not, uh, there's still plenty of bugs, but they're now all in developer written code and they're bugs in sort of developer semantics, or so to speak. Um, so the question I'm interested in thinking about is how can we defend against bugs about mistakes written by developers? And in writing zero knowledge, uh, well, writing code using that ends up 
being compiled to circuits using CKPs, especially which aims to provide privacy or other uh, such properties. Developers are most likely, more likely than anything else, to make cryptography mistakes because it's hard to understand the cryptography, uh, especially if you don't have a deep background in it, and especially if you're writing a complex application at the same time. So the question is, what compiler stacks provide the most protection to developers while also being efficient enough that they will actually use them. If you have a very safe compiler stack and it's not fast enough and latency is too high for practical applications, then no one will be any safer because no one will use it. Um, there are some different constraints here than in the design of ordinary, ordinary uh, compilers. Uh, one, there's some really like threshold latency constraints, at least it seems that way to me. In most cases, users, at least if you want privacy, users have to be creating the proofs. And when users are creating the proofs, there's just a big difference between like three seconds latency and 10 seconds latency. Whereas in normal, normal compilers, you might be able to tolerate, you know, if you're running a spreadsheet processing program, like a uh, difference of like a factor of two may not actually matter that much. The person can just do something else as long as they're not running it too frequently. And often you care about like user interaction latency, which is one reason why for example, you don't use um, uh, you know, one pass garbage collection. You want incremental garbage collection and interactive programs because you don't want long latency times. Uh, but this doesn't apply in uh, zero knowledge proof systems because all of the uh, interactions are non-interactive and you have very like specific threshold latency constraints. Um, another, another class of parties that we want to defend against are us in writing lots of zero knowledge proof systems and compilers. And my hope is that, you know, as an ecosystem, we can come up with at least some reusable components of the compiler stack that can be shared by multiple parties and verified uh, so that we can reuse that effort. So in this talk, part of our efforts at Heliax, because we've come into this game relatively recently, have just been, and there's a lot of existing work, have been to kind of develop a taxonomy for different classes of compilation approaches. Um, and we have classed them into three broad categories, which uh, we term a DSL or domain specific language, instruction set architecture, such so virtual machine compilation, and direct compilation. And I'll talk about what those are go over their trade-offs at a kind of architectural and safety level, describe the direct approach because it's probably the one uh, that people here might be least familiar with, um, and then give a sort of few non-falsifiable predictions as to what will determine uh, the state of CKP compiler security. Next slide. So the first approach and the approach that uh, chronologically uh, we started with, I think, is what I call the DSL approach. And the DSL approach is basically to take a um, something like R1CS or Plonk, R1CS being, being the one which was around first, or AIR, and um, build a DSL on top of it, where you kind of craft a language iteratively, and DSL instructions almost act like constraint writing macros. Uh, you know, some variables can be tracked. There's some sort of simple compilation going on, but there's no intermediate specified instruction set. And, you know, instructions in the DSL translate pretty directly to constraints. Um, so examples of this, of course, with variations uh, within them, but examples of this include Socrates, Circom, Snarky, Leo, Judic Circuits, uh, Project Vars, and probably many others uh, of which I'm unaware. Um, and in the case of using a DSL, this is an important difference uh, with the next approach, each program generates unique circuits. Um, while there are differences in particular, these are all following the same kind of general approach to compilation and to being DSLs without a defined instruction set architecture, they're all like completely different, like your semantics are uh, vary. Of course, they have similarities, but there's some, the semantics of these languages are specific and designed for their proof systems in general. Next slide. So what uh, are the kind of pros and cons of the DSL compilation approach? Um, well, the first pro, uh, which is not one to be neglected, is that it's relatively easy to write a DSL uh, because you can iteratively build abstractions on top of constraints. Um, you don't need to define a whole different architecture. Um, and because you can, you know, uh, you have this lower level control, so you can use a DSL kind of almost as a way to write your hand-rolled circuit optimizations, but just less painfully, um, and to reason about performance, because the developer writing the DSL usually kind of has to understand what constraints each instruction is translated into. Uh, but 
in some sense for the same reason, these DSLs aren't as capable of high level abstractions, at least not without more complex compilation passes. Um, and the semantics, you know, one, uh, uh, I think important distinction between different compiler pipeline approaches is that with some approaches like DSLs, developers are always going to need to learn like the semantics of a circuit specific language in order to write circuits. If you write, uh, you know, Socrates or uh, Starkey or something like this. Uh, now, you know, to give credit to Starkey, maybe it looks a little bit more like TypeScript, although that can also be dangerous if it looks like, but isn't exactly the same as. But still, here there are like some different semantics that developers have to learn and have to understand in order to safely write circuits. Um, and if they're writing programs which include some circuit components and some non circuit components, those are two different semantics. Uh, and that may be more likely to induce bugs. Um, another note about the DSL approach is that. At least as far as I'm aware, most of these DSLs aren't, you know, don't build in any kind of, with the possible exception of, I guess, the one just presented by Morgan, don't build in much in the way of a type system. So you need to use some external proof system to verify. And sometimes that can be applied to, like, it sounds like it's been done with Cairo to check that the semantics of the DSL match the semantics of the underlying uh, arithmetization to which it is compiled but you do need to use external systems and that doesn't solve the problem of program verification. So if I write a program in the DSL and I want to verify that it has particular properties, I have to use you know, some proof system, maybe ACL2 or something that's capable of reasoning about uh, the semantics of the DSL. Next slide. So the next uh, compilation approach that I'm aware of is uh, what we term instruction set architecture or, or sort of intermediate instruction set architecture virtual machine. In uh, this approach is more involved. It involves defining, clearly defining an intermediate instruction set or VM architecture. So that instead, you know, we assume, although you can write in the instruction set, we assume the developers usually don't. Now there are kind of two compiler pieces involved. So there's a higher level language and in this approach that higher level language can vary, which compiles to the instruction set. And then the instruction set has a circuit written in some proof system, which can verify execution traces. Um, so this can be done with an existing instruction set. For example, the RISC-0 team has done this with the RISC-5, uh, you know, originally designed as computer micro microarchitecture. And they've written the Stark proof and verifier for it and associated circuit, which can verify execution traces. Um, or the instruction set can be designed specifically to kind of be efficient for some proof system. Um, and potentially recursive verification or something else you might want to do. And there are perhaps two good examples of this. I know I'm sure there are more. Uh, Mind VM uh, and Triton VM uh, both uh, work with Starks. Triton is specifically focused, I think, on efficiently implementing recursion in the VM. Uh, but all of these approaches use one circuit for all programs. They use a, um, you know, they will support different higher level languages. Um, all of which just have to compile to this instruction set. And I think all of these at least are kind of von Neumann architecture style machines. So there's a stack, maybe some memory um, and operations which manipulate the stack. Next slide. So some trade-offs to these approaches. Um, the great advantage, especially of using a existing microarchitecture such as RISC-V as the developers can use high level languages, the semantics of which they will be familiar with. Um, and if you use a ISA, which is already standardized, you can reuse lots of existing to tooling, like anything which compiles to RISC-V, which is anything that compiles to LVM, which is almost everything you would care about, um, can be compiled to uh, RISC-V and then used with the RISC-0 system. That's not so true if you use uh, if you create a new uh, virtual machine instruction set, which might be more efficient, but doesn't have existing compiler tooling support. However, it's still true that compiler or compilation techniques to these kinds of stack based VMs for both imperative and functional languages are pretty well known, standardized, um, and you can draw from a lot of existing literature. Um, some disadvantages of this approach is, although it's unclear exactly what this cost is, there is probably going to be some cost of abstraction when you're compiling your high level programs through this or to this like intermediate instruction set, you know, you're doing stack operations and you have to check those stack operations in the circuit. 
and maybe you could have done that more directly. Um, this one has reason to expect will be especially true, or there will be a higher performance penalty if the instruction set architecture wasn't built specifically for CKPs. Uh, in the case of RISC V, it's not clear yet what this performance penalty is. Uh, we're trying to assemble some benchmarks of some of these systems to get a better hand on it. It's also tricky because they're often using different proof systems, and so you're not comparing apples to apples. Um, but uh, that might be one disadvantage. Um, arguably, this approach offers more power than you kind of need and is you know, correspondingly going to be harder to verify because it's more powerful. Um, uh, there's a lot of noise about Turing comp completeness, but no one really wants to run CKP computations that don't terminate, uh, like you would never be able to make a proof in practice. Um, this is different, at least in some sense, than the interactive world where most, you know, your like interactive program spreadsheet or whatever never terminates because it has some loop that's like take more user input and do whatever action the user said to do. Uh, but when we're making certain knowledge proofs, uh, although the application in some sense doesn't terminate, the uh, circuits uh, always terminate. Um, also in this approach, you need to use some external systems for verification of your ISA, and you have to verify all of the compilation passes involved if you want to verify the compiler stack. So you need to verify the translation uh, from the instruction set semantics to the lower level arithmetization or proof system, and you need to verify the higher level compilation passes that transform whatever language developers are actually writing to the the uh, and then developers of course need to verify the semantics of their programs in the higher level languages although if you're using existing or more powerful higher level languages there's probably a lot of existing work that could be reused here uh, next slide so the third approach um, or the third class of approaches uh, for lack of a better word we just call direct um, and the idea here is to somehow directly compile higher level programs to circuits. Uh, there could be, you know, where higher level programs, you know, to us, it means actually functional um, programs using something derived from the lambda calculus, uh, you know, to somebody else it could mean a higher level imperative language where you have some transformation capable of without an intermediate instruction set, taking that higher level semantics and transforming it to a circuit. Um, and what this transformation is could vary. Uh, the sort of best candidate that we're aware of for the kind of higher level languages uh, that we're interested in um, is a, based on a paper called Compiling to Categories by Cornell Elliott, uh, which works by taking the kind of core that you can transform a functional language to uh, simply typed lambda calculus or in extensions, uh, dependently typed variants with data types uh, translating those operations into operations uh, of a closed Cartesian category, and then translating the categorical operations into kind of the category of polynomial operations and translating polynomial operations into a specific circuit. So similar to the DSL approach, uh, with a direct approach, each program generates a unique circuit, uh, but here we're still, we're kind of taking directly the semantics of the higher level language and generating a circuit. And you can find some more information on how that actually works. Uh, this URL, which I realize is quite long, but I will share the slides afterwards. Next slide. Now, I've actually not heard of other approach. I mean, DSL, you know, there could be a, a, a sort of continuum of DSLs where they approach higher and higher level semantics and get more and more like this kind of direct compilation. Um, I don't know of other sort of high level approaches for direct compilation of functional languages, but there may be many and I would be interested hearing about them. So uh, some kind of pros and cons of this approach. Um, developers can use a very high level language and at least in principle you can get very high performance because you aren't, you know, the, you don't lose any information when you compile this way. You don't have to represent things in terms of intermediate stack operations. Um, it's a kind of interesting avenue of compilation to explore in general. It's similar to some existing work in hardware circuit synthesis uh, done kind of outside of the context of CKPs, but in the context of the end of Moore's law and needing compiler pipelines that rely on the ability, you know, wanting to produce um, uh, physical circuits uh, or more parallel programs. Um, at least with compiling to categories, compilation has a very clear mathematical model. So it's pretty straightforward to verify that 
uh, you know, although the higher level language part may still be complex, it's state straightforward to verify that the transformations from simply type lambda calculus to polynomials are correct. Um, and as with the intermediate ISA approach, you can verify um, your program semantics in the higher level language. Um, cons of this approach, there's more complexity in the compiler pipeline, at least as compared to simple DSLs. Um, I'm not sure if this would work, like if you wanted to directly compile Rust to a circuit. I mean, obviously you can't compile all programs. You would need to pick a subset. Um, it's it's like less clear to me how that would work. Um, although maybe there's still approaches possible in principle. Uh, and as in general, with any approach that involves a higher degree of abstraction, it may be more difficult for developers to reason about the performance of their programs. Um, although in this approach, it's easy to kind of segment out where compiler passes have or compiler optimization passes have to happen in the pipeline. Next slide. Okay, so uh, an interesting question that you might ask is where, you know, there are like a lot of compilation approaches being tried right now, and what might we expect to happen? Um, and so where can our efforts best be spent now? Um, these approaches have different trade-offs, particularly in terms of kind of potential performance or low-level control and degree of abstraction and ease for developers to write programs. And for this reason, I think that probably we're going to see a hybridization of approaches, that these sort of lower level DSL or directly writing constrained approaches or what the, for example, what the electric coin company has done in heavily optimizing the Halo 2 circuits via a, a high degree of, of Dara and Strad magic will, uh, those approaches will dominate for kind of crucial gadgets, built in functions, hashes, and arithmetic, maybe recursive verification, other kind of very performance critical building blocks. And then the uh, one of the latter two approaches, instruction set architecture slash virtual machine or direct compilation will dominate for compilation of what you might call the business logic of programs or what programmers are writing and kind of stitching together these lower level primitives, which will be available in some kind of standard library. Um, and the reason I think this hybridization is likely is that it kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You get, you know, you, you spend your optimization time or so to speak, which is time of people writing optimized circuits. You spend that time on the parts on the hotspots of your code, these like built in functions um, and use a, you know, perhaps less efficient, uh, but easier to reason about compilation pipeline or easier for developers to reason about compilation pipeline to compile the business logic. This is also similar to the structure of cryptographic systems today. If you look at, you know, what, uh, how people write cryptographic protocols, there's usually hardware support, at least after standardization for specific standardized and optimized primitives, hash functions, uh, public key cryptography, this sort of thing. And higher level languages are used to write the protocols, which just tie these components together. Um, I suspect we'll see many varying verification attempts. Uh, but hopefully we can converge on some parts of the compiler stack that can be verified and we can, you know, at least many people can be used. That's pretty much it. Next slide. Hope that was helpful. Um, I would have loved to give a sort of more in-depth approach on the direct approach of compilation, but I think it would really benefit from, it just needs more exposition. So instead I direct you to the links here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and our, uh, we have a repository in which we're actually trying to assemble a kind of benchmark comparison of all of these approaches and uh, sort of taxonomize the trade-offs. And we, uh, at least at the moment, included in here uh, is our uh, skeleton code for direct compilation. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk, Chris. I guess the next speaker is you, uh, a professor at UCSB and the founder of Veridis or very dice. Actually, you can correct me. I'm not sure how to, to pronounce that. Yes, it's very dice. Uh, very just dice. Give me one, just give me one second and then uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. So um, today I will be talking about a kind of like a complementary approach uh, with the previous speaker in a sense that as the developer, so how can you gain some like a basic like a security like without like like actual effort for writing spec, which is more like a push button verification approach for zk circuit.
And then my short talk is going to break into three sections. And first I will give you uh, some like a brief overview about what we mean by formal method as well as formal verification, assuming that some of you might not be familiar with the terminology before. And uh, so after that, I will be de describing a system which we try to um, like perform a push button verification for detect uh, common bugs in ZK circuit. And finally, I will wrap up the talk with um, some ongoing work as well as uh, next step. So basically, uh, for those of you who might not familiar with formal method before, so formal method, they are not referring to a particular technique or uh, or a tooling. Instead, it actually referring to technique uh, that corresponds to a set of mathematical reasoning approach. And here, so this is essentially a brief spectrum of formal method in the sense that x axis corresponds to the amount of guarantee you can gain. Of course, the higher the better. And then y axis is essentially correspond to the amount of human effort. And then you want it to be as minimum as possible. So for instance, um, without any human effort, what's the, what's the basic thing you can do? You can do some basic testing. You can do some random fuzzing, which will give you some kind of knowledge about how well your circuit perform and then whether there's some, some, some obvious debug that you can identify before you shift to a productions. And on the other extreme, um, so you can also like perform formal verification like Morgan as well, Eli mentions, in the sense that, um, so you provide the functional specifications and then, um, and, then, and then after that you apply some kind of interactive theory approach to verify the behavior of, of your circuits actually conform with the actual specification. And why this approach like give you the highest assurance and then the downside is essentially it requires a tons of human effort, not just writing the spec, but also you need domain expert to essentially write those kind of proof, let's say in COG or Lean. Uh, for instance, in our one of our projects uh, to try to formally verify the circuit library, it took us two PhD students over three months to verify the whole library. And um, so that's why in here, in this talk, I will mostly focusing on the approach in the middle ground in a sense that um, even, even though like a formally verify or finding bugs in your circuit is undecidable in general, but what, what can we do if we rely on like a push button approach? Okay. And of course, before we talk about the actual approach, we need to understand our, like, uh, our target a little bit better. So when we talk about ZK circuit, they are not just independent piece of software. They are actually embedded in a piece of sophisticated system, like what we have seen in operating system or Androids, et cetera. So here you can think of at the very bottom, you have some common library uh, like for ZK. And then those, those libraries will be involved by many, many other application circuits. And then on top of the application circuit, you also have the end, like end user which, uh, who will be interact with um, some application written in smart contracts such as uh, in Solidity or Cairo. And so, which means that given this complex stuff, so there's not a single way from this diagram can actually solve all your problem, right? And so, and as we noticed that every software has bugs, including operating system, Android application, and so does ZK circuit. Um, so, and this is just some like a, like a brief, uh, um, like overview about some of the representative systems that I collected uh, in the past few months, and some of them from ADO Snap uh, Virtual Machine, and then the last one is from the Scroll uh, uh, systems. And as you can see, so for those bugs, some of the bugs can be actually very scary in the sense that if you if you look at the last one, so a lookup uh, a lookup functionality, if there's a bug, it can actually uh, it's essentially cause a denial of service to your your, your entire mainnet. And so if you look at that, um, those bugs a little bit closer, you will notice that those bugs are actually not particular like a for like a particular circuit that you might care about. Those bugs could be shared by any arbitrary circuit that you might uh, encounter. For instance, in any kind of circuit, when you implement the keycat, uh, the keycat lookup function, you really want uh, it to not causing any denial of service, right? And then when you write any proof uh, with your circuit, you really want to ensure some kind of deterministic features. Otherwise, so it might behave in a random way. So which means that those, those bugs that we identify is actually some kind of, you can categorize as a kind of a common vulnerability. And then it would be nice to have some kind of a, like a tooling uh, that can automatically detect those kind of problems without like relying on the human to write down the formal spec for them. 
And to solve this problem, so we actually working on two, uh, two uh, different kind of tooling. And then so at the bottom, you can think of the way we adjust the security and the correctness of the ZK core ZK library. It's very similar to what you see from Morgan and Eli's talk in the sense that we use interact theory improver in this case in Coq to formally verify a set of critical libraries. In this case, we use Coq and then we instantiate the tool into the circum library. And then after that, um, so, so what we do is essentially we plug in the summary of those uh, proof result and then into the application circuit, which heavily use uh, those kind of library. And so uh, because the developer cannot afford, like let's say hiring a bunch of like a formal method experts to write down those proof with months and months of effort. And they also cannot write a very sophisticated formal like a specifications. So in this case, what can, they can do is essentially they can use another tooling called PyCars, which essentially can perform some kind of library symbolic execution to find some like a common vulnerabilities. And then, so right now I'm going to dive into this uh, diagram a little bit about what, uh, what's the key design of our systems for detecting common ZK circuit. And before we talk about uh, like finding common, like a problem or of property violation, we need to know what kind of property are we talking about. For instance, as you mentioned, um, as Eli mentioned, so this problem is in general is undecidable. So which means that, um, so if you want to adopt a push button approach, like uh, the user just need to provide a piece of software as well as the property, and then you can automatically detect this kind of bugs. So which means that one thing we need to sacrifice is essentially sacrifice the expressiveness of the property that you want to verify. For instance, here are some properties that we instantiate into our current uh, tooling. So one property um, you can imagine is essentially what we call weak, verific uh, weak verification or weak uni uniqueness in the sense that, uh, let's say uh, I have a program on the right-hand side. And then in this program, what you do is very basic. You initialize some array and then you, array you assign those arrays, uh, some of the value to its corresponding like a witness variables. And then those pieces of program will be translated into its corresponding like R1 CS representations. And so let's forget about what this program is trying to do. But one property you always want to enforce is that the output should be uniquely determined by the input, right? Otherwise you will be in trouble. In the, in the application level, you might enable like a double spending. And also in, at some points, you might not be happy with just weak verification. You also want to make sure that not just the output um, should be uniquely determined, but also all those intermediate like witness variables should also be uniquely determined. So which means that this is essentially some kind of a common property that you really want to enforce like through all the circuit, no matter what their functionality is going to be. And the idea of the push button verifications, it's relatively clear in a sense that you take uh, you take input as a program, as well as a property you want to detect. And then, so you can think of the tool is essentially adding like a compiler that is going to compile your, your property and program into its corresponding constraint that can be reasoned about by an off the shell constraint solver. For instance, just to give you a very, very simple example here at the bottom, I have a very, very naive uh, program which essentially assign different value to y, um, like a, a pending determined by the, the input of the of the arguments, right? And then at the end, so the property I want to enforce is that I have an assertion that try to enforce that y should always greater than four, okay? So what uh, the push button verification is trying to do is essentially, I'm going to uh, have a tool that is going to compile this piece of program into an SMT formula, okay, in the middle. So you can think of this SMT formula does not represent a concrete output, but it's essentially a, an expression that quantifies the space of all possible behavior of this program. And then at the end, so you throw this SMT formula into a constraint solver, and then the constraint solver will tell you whether this actually uh, like a proof hole all the time given arbitrary input. In this case, the constraint solver will return no, because if A is going to less or equal than zero, then uh, the assertion will be violated. So this is essentially the, idea of most like a push button verifications. And he has been working very, very well uh, in the context of smart contract. But you might wondering why can we just like a plug-in, like replace the program on the left-hand side with let's say ZK circuit, right? And uh, shouldn't we like, like just reuse the existing pilot? And it turned out that this is non-trivial because there are many, many challenges here. There are 
domain specific uh, to ZK. First, we are not talking about hundreds or thousand lines of smart contract. We are talking about large circuit that can could potentially translate into millions of uh, constraints. And then there are non-linear operation everywhere, and then which can screw up like a default SMT solver very easily. And then here, we are not just talking about reasoning about like integer or bit vector. We are trying to reason about finite field, which is very, very bad for existing uh, set solver. So, so given this kind of a challenge, even if you use the state of the uh, finite field solver, for instance, the one from CDC5, and you can only scale to like a circuit with a couple of dozens lines of constraint. And so what we, um, the way that we address this problem is essentially we design our own like, uh, like a decision procedure, which is you can think of existing, uh, what we do essentially our decision procedure is, go, is going to build on top of a finite field solver. And then the finite field solver is going to rely on an of the shell set solver like every other theory solver has been doing. And the, what the theories, uh, what the ZK uh, theory solver is trying to do is a very, uh, it's a standard DPL loop in a sense that let's say it take input as a circuit R, okay, as well as a property omega. And then what we try to prove is that whether there's all the signals here, like the signal can be an output signal or it can be uh, including the intermediate uh, weakness variable. So we want to return uh, true if, um, if all the signal like hold for omega, otherwise we return false. And then the way we do that is essentially it's a, it's a work list uh, uh, loops in the sense that we first initialize um, a knowledge with the input signal in the sense that we assuming that the input signal always satisfy the, the property omega we try to um, approve. In this case, omega can correspond to uniqueness property that you want to verify. And so what we do is essentially uh, we initialize the initial step with the propagation set. And what we do is essentially starting from the original um, um, like, a, like a signal in which we know that it holds for those property, we want to verify, we, we start like a propagation, which is very similar to like a BCP in constraint solving. In a sense that let's say I, I noticed, I know that X is going to be unique. And then if you see a statement like X equal to uh, you're going to assign X to Y, so, and which means that those kind of information properties is going to propagate from X to Y. So you do like a propagation as, ma as, as many times as you could until you reach a fixed point. Okay. And then, so now you are, you are, you are, you are trying to like, uh, and of course there, now there are some remaining signal you cannot handle. So what we are going to do is essentially you apply some heuristic to select some like signal that you want to work on. And then, so you query the constraint solver, which is essentially the stack I show you on the right hand side. You query the constraint solver whether, like this, like a signal that you pick actually satisfies the omega that you you want to verify. And then, if it's if it's true, which means that you know additional fact uh, that also hold for the omega. So in this case, you're going to propagate and add those um, additional signal to your to your propagation set, and then you repeat the whole loop again. So otherwise, so when the tool tell you that, hey, you actually find a signal that is violating the, the omega that you want to prove. So in this case, what you're going to do is that you're going to check whether your current signal data set is already equivalent to the goal that you try to prove. If you already try, if you already reach the goal in the sense that the set you're trying to prove to be satisfying the, uh, uh, the omega is going to equal to your current like a, like a knowledge, then you are going to return true. Otherwise, you are going to return false. Okay, and then this iteration keep over and over again until you like uh, return the answer. Okay, and so as you can see, this is essentially the high level architecture of the like a customized decision procedure that we designed for for zk circuit. And then there's many many uh, details uh, that are not here. So for instance, one optimization that we um, have done is essentially. When you try to prove uh, some property of your circuit, um, so the solver, a default solver um, on, the, on, on the previous slide might not be able to prove your argument because it is missing some invariance uh, that is not obviously obtained by the current programs. So for instance, given a particular input, um, so you want to, there was some additional information that is not available in the sense that 
Um, so the in, you might want to know that the input is actually not arbitrary integer, but it's it's actually any integer, but uh, non-zero, et cetera. So the way we uh, attack this problem is that in, uh, to avoid like a human involved in the loop. So what we do is essentially we incorporate an, an invariant synthesis loop in the sense that we define a DSL on the right-hand side, which essentially quantify some common shape of the invariants um, that are relevant to proving property of a ZK in this domain. And then, so when we, we involve the, the uh, constraint solver on the previous slide. And then if it went through, that's great. If it doesn't went through in the sense that it cannot prove a particular property for a circuit, what we do is essentially we trigger the synthesis engine to ask the engine to essentially it's a guess and check loop in a sense that can you try to infer like additional invariance that can be useful for our current, like uh, proving the current property. So this is one trick that we apply. And then another trick um, that we apply is essentially, we are not just talking about like a small circuit. We are talking about circuit that can pot potentially generating millions of constraints. For instance, uh, one of our clients that we have been working with, um, their circuit can turn into half millions R1CS constraints. So in this case, if you naively convert, if you naively convert the whole like a circuit into its corresponding constraints, constraint system and then you throw to the SMT solver, it's more like a throw the universe to the SMT solver and it's not going to work. So what we do uh, in this approach, we actually adopt a modular verification uh, algorithm in the sense that what we do is essentially we take the program dependence graph for the circuit and then we try to do that in a bottom up manner in the sense that we first uh, verify the property of each individual gadget. And then, so once we in, in verify each individual gadget uh, with respect to the Omega uh, that we try to approve, and then we automatically plug in those, uh, the summary of those gadgets into its corresponding color. So which means that next time when I try to verify a particular circuit in the non-leaf node, I don't need to reanalyze the whole branch again. So instead, all I need to do is I just need to plug in the, the the assumptions or the assumption I just proved in the in the previous iterations, and uh, so here is some preliminary result. And there's uh, on the circumlib library, and uh, for, as you can see, um, so here the y x corresponds to the accuracy, and then the higher the better. And um, so what we do essentially we compare our approach with um, one of the relevant work from ACNI, which is sponsored by Zero X Park and Ethereum Foundations. And so we take, uh, I think the benchmark total increase uh, 67 um, circuit. And so as you can see, our approach was able to prove like, uh, like over um, about 98% of the circuits, which uh, perform like much better compared to the, the, the baseline. And then we are still like working on a lot of uh, scaling the tooling to a lot of industry like a circuits with, uh, with large uh, constraints. And here, I just want to share some line about some ongoing uh, work that we have been working on. Like for instance, uh, we have been also working on the specification language that is um, agnostic to the compiler and the programming languages uh, for ZK circuit in the sense that uh, there should be some specification language that will allow the circuit programmer to express some library property uh, that they want to enforce uh, without a heavy, like a, like a, like a strong background in formal verifications. And then we also um, working on extending our current um, pipeline to support like a more like a complicated circuit in Halo 2 and Pronky. And, uh, and then we also have a team that is uh, contributing to the uh, improving the finite field solver because as you can see from the, this uh, stack, at the end of the day, so essentially all of the bottleneck essentially will be boiled down to the constraint solver. And uh, uh, that's pretty much uh, all I want to share today. And then all the two dimensions is actually um, open source and available online and feel free to access and then uh, sh uh, share your comments. And uh, thank you for listening. Cool, Th thanks a lot you for, for the talk. I guess, I guess we should transition to, to the panel. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have left. I think Eli has dropped because uh, he had um, he couldn't make it. So it's going to be the the four the four of us. I I guess I can start with a question until we get to the slides. But um, like I, I guess when I think of formal verification, the the biggest 
issue or not issue, but the biggest challenge for, for me or from my perspective as kind of a user perspective is how do you make it friendly to the user? Like we, we've seen formal verifications uh, grow in like different sorts of fields. And I think the hardest is always to get the users to actually use the tools that are in place. Um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering if you guys had some thoughts on that or uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, whoever wants to join in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this one and that um, we, uh, uh, Professor Yu, to be clear, I'm, I'm with him in that uh, I believe that the uh, best like long-term sustainable approach is to avoid requiring application developers to do theorem proving. Um, and so like you can use you can use proof discovery or like spec validation tools uh, or program validation tools uh, and you can uh, use verifying compilers um, and those those two in combination should probably cover most of the needs because um, like like I'm, I'm still a little unclear on what spec validation is right like what do you need to do to prove that a spec is correct do you just need to look at it and know that it knows it means what you intended it to mean? Or, or, it, or are there theorems you can prove about specs sometimes to, to convince yourself that it's correct? I think probably more the latter. And so I think there's, there's room for these approaches to work together. Yeah, so yeah. I, I actually agree that specification validation is actually very, very important. And it's, it's not just important for the ZK domain, but actually very important in general, for instance, in the context of smart contract, we also observe that a lot of developers, they try to provide a spec, but the spec is actually inconsistent with their white paper. So one thing uh, we try to do in this domain is essentially, um, uh, we can is essentially just, uh, do some kind of automatic specification inference based on the white paper. Uh, from the from the from the from the from the user, and then of course it's not going to be precise because of limitation of translating natural language into uh, formal specification, but um, you can always like do some kind of a, like a approximations to essentially guess what the developer is trying to enforce and compare with what they wrote, and if there's any kind of discrepancies, it might be the case that either there's a bugs in their original spec or it might be there's something they didn't write. Uh, precisely in their original white paper. Um, so another way I can think of to mitigate this kind of specification validation problem is essentially, right now we only see a few amount of effort on applying like a form verification to ZK circuit. But once you um, like uh, increase the adoptions of this kind of approach, you can see more and more samples of different people writing spec. And then you can do some kind of cross, uh, cross validations. Uh, between like a different people of a uh, spec of different people, but why like a uh, targeting on similar functionality. To add to that, at least to me, the kind of end goal of verification is actually that we get out of this world that we're currently in where users trust developers because it's not a very secure world. And I just don't think we're going to reach large scale adoption as long as we're in that world and get to a world where users distrust developers and distrust programs and the interfaces users are using, be they browser extensions, web wallets, phone applications, things like this encode specific properties and proof checkers, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason why I think this makes sense is, is because what determines the safety for users of applications is the mm -hmm. layer of abstraction at which they are interacting and whether their understanding of the semantics of that layer of abstraction is accurate to the privacy and kind of security, life and safety semantics of what's actually going on in the underlying system. So for example, when you use uh, MetaMask to send like ERC-20 tokens, that is like uh, UI convention plus trust. There is nothing that enforces that when you actually tell the contract to do an ERC-20 transfer, it does anything like an ERC-20 transfer. It's just, you know, there's a list of like verified tokens or something. It's embedded by default into MetaMask and users can enter a contract address. It's convention. Um, and I suspect that we will want to move to a world where rather, you know, the 
uh, MetaMask equivalent encodes what it means for something to be a token. Uh, perhaps that supply is conserved in some fashion, and that only people who own the token can spend it, a few other invariants, and that if a you know, contract wants to be supported by that interface, it is going to need to provide proofs of those properties. And it could do other things, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact code match. But I think that's the kind of eventual frontier of verification. And the question will be sort of given, you know, what what will the interfaces look like? What will kind of the accepted specification languages, formal specification languages for these properties look like? And you know, whatever of the pipeline of, from developers writing code to actually proving those properties we can automate, like the more of that we can automate, the better. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, different approaches there have different trade-offs, but I do think we want to be aiming for the world of end user verification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, interesting. Yeah, it, it sounds like, yeah, that's, that's like a step up from, from like writing specs as the developer of like your your like specific like you want a spec that would verify things on other apps, right? Um, yeah. So what, I guess like I I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but like it sounds like there's two different approaches where you're either writing a spec and you have like a different language to write your your circuit or your your app in, or you write a spec that will uh, derive and generate the, the code for you and, or the circuit for you. Um, I guess for the people who, who know more about formal verification, like what, what is the most, uh, popular approach and like, what are the pros and cons, I guess there, and, and what do we want for, for us, right? Like for the ZK world, like what's, what do we want? <laughs> so, so to my understanding, so those two kind of approach is kind of a complementary to each other in the sense that if I am a very careful like a programmer in the sense that I roll my program in a very careful way with a high level programming language, I can guarantee that it's not going to make any mistake. So here you, you can think of this kind of spec itself is also a programming languages like a domain specific DSL. And then in this case, like the best approach will be you relying on the, the compilation tooling and then to make sure that it's going to correct from the beginning to the end. However, so what's happened in reality is that when people write code, um, they cannot ensure that their code is actually correct. And then they, are, they cannot even ensure that the spec is even correct. So, which means that in that case, we might also need to provide some like a lightweight, like a flexibility in some kind of like a partial correctness uh, guarantee in the sense that even if the developer, let's say specifies something that is potentially incorrect or they didn't specify anything, or they specify something that is partially correct. So what can we do for them to at least make sure that um, you can at least de detect some kind of common vulnerabilities? And of course, if the developer can specify the full functional correctness, then you can essentially leverage the pipeline that um, like uh, Morgan has showed before. I, I think we've seen that for is it the last Wi-Fi standard, like they formally verified it. And I can't remember exactly for, like we've seen that several times, I guess. When one of the last, I think, was for the Wi-Fi standard, like there was a, it was formally verified, but I guess they didn't write the spec correctly, or they made a mistake there, and they proved they proved the wrong thing, and uh, it doesn't help if you're proving the wrong thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's an interesting Next question step. as to whether the assurance you get from uh, writing, uh, uh, you know, having someone write. Uh, proof in some other proof system is more from the proof system or more from someone else having to understand your protocol well enough to be able to write a proof of it. And in virtue of thinking about it, potentially catching bugs, right? They're both helpful. Um, I mean, I think at the moment we see kind of a verification ecosystem mostly dominated by proof systems that are separate from the languages in which developers write programs, uh, you know, Agda, Coq, Idris is more straddling the line, but still probably falls into this category. Um, C3, other kind of Isabel whole other proof systems um, tend to be separate from the languages in which developers write programs. Uh, I also think this is a cause of many bugs and it's perhaps unnecessary in like a broad systemic sense. It's just more contingent on you know the research progressing in parallel and often these being separate groups of people and 
of course, it's contingent upon uh, performance constraints dictating that often implementations had to be made in performant languages um, when there wasn't some option that could provide both performance and verifiability. So I think what we converge to really depends on whether we can find a kind of more spec-like high-level language that can also compile to something performant enough, maybe with some lower-level gadgets if we can. To me, that seems like something worth trying for, at least as an option. You know, maybe we can't. Uh, it will end up much like the current state of the world. But still, now there is some progress yeah. towards more, you know, more fusion of these domains. It, it sounds really like a hard. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, like I think the Everest project, or like the Inria, Inria and Microsoft, I guess, trying to create a formal, formally verified stack for OpenSSL. And I think they've been doing that for, I don't know, at this point, maybe 10 years. Um, so it, yeah, it sounds very difficult to, to do these kind of things. Also in the realm of formal verification tooling. So in cryptography, you have different tools like, um, I guess, EasyCrypt or, or Coq or uh, CryptoVerif. Um, there's Tamarin and they're all pretty hard to use. And I've seen actually, People don't really tend to use them because they're too hard to use. And I've seen people using things like Verifal, which are like newer verification tools that are like really imperfect. Um, and they will like miss some bugs, but they're like so easy to use that people are more incentivized to like try, try them and maybe find bugs by, by using them. So yeah, I really think that you, you can do a trade-off and maybe not have the maybe a less useful tool, but since it's like more user-friendly and more easier to use, people will actually use it. And the more people use it, the more bugs you can find and, and these kind of things. Um, so I, I think we have to end the panel. Uh, maybe Morgan, you haven't talked to yeah, yeah. anything else you want to? <laughs> if I could just add on to this question briefly. Um, the So um, regarding the, um, you know, how should we go about um, like, sustainably incorporating formal verification into the ZKP industry. Um, it seems like uh, in order to accomplish this, uh, we really uh, need to let go of a lot of legacy stuff, um, including the von Neumann architecture. Um, like if you're trying to verify machine code, then you need to have um, a formal model of your processor and verifying like von Neumann programs it has always been difficult. Um, so I think like a good approach here could be to uh, be compiling, um, you know, like, like algorithms specified in your proof assistant down to uh, circuit graphs, which you could then print onto an FPGA or an ASIC. Um, and so then like, like what I'm contending is that that would be efficient and also easier to verify than, you know, if you're tying yourself to the legacy of the von Neumann architecture. Cool. Uh, interesting. All right. So I guess we, we can leave it on, on that and uh, we'll, we'll think more about that. I think we're out of time now. Cheers. Um, thanks everyone. So, yeah. Thanks, all. thanks to all the Thank speakers, you. including myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, what should I do? Should I, do I have to press a button? <laughs> <laughs>